we're going to have a discussion about two of the most important values in public education. We want to reward students who work hard in their spare time to develop other skills such as playing a musical instrument, joining the choir, or becoming good dancers. But we also want to ensure that all kids, regardless of their postal code, get a chance to experience those enriching things too. Can that be done? Can we have both merit and equity in public education? Let's ask. Rachel Chernus Lynn. She is the chair of the Toronto District School Board and the trustee for Ward 11 Don Valley West. Richard Bilkstow is a former secondary school principal in the same board. And Tasha Kiridan is an author, commentator, and for the purposes of this discussion, a parent with a daughter who in the fall will enter the Toronto school system. Great to have all three of you here tonight for our discussion. Tasha, I'm going to go to you first because we are having this discussion tonight in part because in its wisdom, the Toronto School Board, in an effort to be more equitable to more students, decided to bring in a bit of a new system as it relates to specialized programs. What did they bring in? So the TDSB has a, a number of specialized schools, uh, ranging from, as you mentioned, the arts to sciences to IB to what they call the TOPS program. International Baccalaureate. Exactly, IB. IB. Um, and uh, these programs um, are uh, usually have been previously uh, attained by means of a merit system. So students would have to either submit a portfolio of work uh, for an art school or do auditions. Um, for a science school, they may have to take tests or show aptitude in other ways through their marks. And so basically the idea was that kids had to strive to attain these schools and they could apply to whichever schools they would choose. So this year, the system changed to be a lottery. Uh, the reason the TDSB did that is because they looked at the makeup of the schools and found that the composition did not reflect the diversity of the Toronto school system as a whole. And the uh, result was that they said, well, we've got to fix this. And the way of fixing it was to create a lottery and reserving 20% of the spots for kids who were considered from underrepresented groups and then putting everyone in a pot where you just basically it was at random. You didn't have to necessarily show an aptitude, you didn't have to do anything really, except for say that you're interested in attending these schools to get a seat. And that's how they did it this year. Richard, what's your view of the lottery system? Well, Steve, I'm actually very concerned that we've moved from a merit-based system to a lottery-based system. The reality is there's many, many students, and you talked about the art schools, but if we look at the other schools, the academic programs, International Baccalaureate, there's many, many students in those programs from other communities, from uh, parents and families with a lower income level, parents with a lower educational uh, level as well. So in some ways, those schools are actually equity examples of equity in the TDSB that are actually working and striving. So I think we have to look at the whole picture. So what the TDSB actually did is went from a merit-based system to a lottery-based system. Rather than making the system more fair, Steve, the system is now unfair. Why is it less fair now? It's less fair now because of a couple of reasons. And I think this is really, really important to note. In the past, students, as Tasha said, had the opportunity to demonstrate an ability, demonstrate a passion, demonstrate an interest. Now, it's all about the luck of a draw. You're actually thrown in a ring, and if your number comes up, your name comes up, you're lucky and you get into that program. And what's very concerning as well, Steve, I think it's really important for the viewers to understand. If I come or my child is in a wealthy family, they have the opportunity to go to a private school. If there is a student whose parent can't afford a private school, simply because of a luck of a draw, they're gonna be out of luck. And that's not fair, that's not equitable. And the other thing I think is really important to note, and I hope we have the chance to discuss this later on, Steve, I really believe that this lottery system will actually destroy the specialized programs in the Toronto District School Board. Okay, more to come on that. Madam Chair, aren't you glad we invited you here tonight? I am. <laughs> it's always great to have discussion on topics that are of passion and interest to students, families, staff. Um, you so know. what was the thinking behind the lottery? So the thinking behind the lottery, first of all, I want to just explain that we only go to a lottery when the number of applicants exceeds seats. And that actually hasn't always been the case in all of our specialized programs. So we o it's only when we have more demand than we have spots, Supply. then we go to a lottery. Um, and, and we don't always need to in every program. So that's first thing to note. 
But the decision was made based on not just data that we had about who was coming into our programs, but also on significant feedback that we had had over the years from families uh, and from students. Because we did do a fairly large consultation when we started reviewing our policy. And of course, we have to review all of our policies every couple of years. We look at each one and we have a constant rotation. But we had decided to create a new specialized um, central student interest program policy. And so we solicited feedback from families about their experiences. And what we learned was that a lot of families felt that these programs weren't for them. There were barriers in place preventing them from applying in the first place what, or preventing them from getting in. What were the barriers? They were things like we had costs to write exams or to apply. And they couldn't afford them. And they couldn't afford them. They sometimes kids couldn't come on the Saturday that they were hosting the exam or the evening they were doing the auditions because many of our students, and we are in a very large urban board, we have 240,000 students, many of them have part-time jobs. They're helping support their families. Um, you know, we know food insecurity has been on the rise. These are really significant pieces. Also, um, the kind of things that we were asking them to do were not necessarily things that they had experience with or the type of, um, the type of program that they necessarily had um, audition experience with or a portfolio. Um, they hadn't been building that portfolio for years and years and years because maybe they hadn't had access to all of that outside programming. So why was the lottery thought to be the best way to approach this issue of trying to be more equitable? So the idea behind it was if students had an interest, let's nurture that. If they had a passion, let's, in, let's nurture that. Because part of public, public education, our value in public education is that if students are given the resources and the high expectations, we do believe they will rise to those. And so if students display like, I have three kids, not a single one of them applied to an arts program or a STEM program because it wasn't something they were passionate about. But if kids are really interested, they will apply if given the opportunity, if given the idea that that application doesn't have barriers in front of it. And we actually know from the data that's come out from the applications this year, we had 3,000, roughly 3,000 more applications. We have students coming from schools that they haven't come from before. We have many more students from different parts of the city. And the other barrier that we had was geography. You know, some of these programs are only in certain parts of the city and the cost of TTC and the time that that would take, that's another barrier. Okay. So, well, to be fair here, uh, mm. we've talked about your kids, so mm. I have to talk about your kid now. Yep. <laughs> to be fair. Now, your daughter, she's, she's in the fall going to join the Toronto District School Board Correct. somewhere. Um, she tried to get into some of these programs. Hey, what, was it, what was the experience that you had? So the experience was my daughter has been an artist since she was able to hold a pencil. She is now 13 and she had always intended to go to an arts high school. That was her goal. Um, and so uh, she applied to, uh, in, the, in the system this year, she was, she was very dismayed about the lottery and um, she thought this was right away an unfair way of doing this. She had been not building a portfolio outside of school with any other assistants, but just on her own. She'd been working and started an Instagram art account and all sorts of things that she wanted to then be able to showcase and was very disappointed. So she applied to Rosedale. We did all the hoops. Um, this is Rosedale School Rosedale of the School Arts. Rosedale School of the Arts, correct. And we were number 82 on the wait list. Uh, her friend, her best friend, um, was 182 on the wait yeah. list. So clearly there were a lot of people who subscribed, applied. Um, we subsequently found out that there were students we knew who had zero interest in the arts, none. They applied because Rosedale has a good reputation and they got in. Um, other kid applied because it was near where they lived and they got in. So my daughter was very upset about this and she was very upset that her friend also, who hails from a minority background, didn't get in uh, because her minority is not considered to be one of the ones that's underrepresented. And she says, but she's going to face discrimination. Sorry, what does that mean? Um, because there's a number that were reserved, like I said, 20% for students who are underrepresented in these types of programs. But her friend is of a different ethnicity that's not on that list. Her friend is? She's of Asian background. She okay. was adopted and from China. And that's not considered underrepresented. It's not considered. So she says, but she faces discrimination. And yet, in the school system, she doesn't count. So there was all these factors. And then finally, she did somehow, after two rounds of, um, of uh revisions because kids, you know, some that choose a different school and they drop off, the wait list gets shorter. We were shocked to get an acceptance. We're like, 
wow, okay. So your daughter got in. She got in, but here's the thing. People say to her now, where are you going to high school? And she says, oh, I'm going to Rosedale Heights School of the Arts. And they go, oh, that's great. And you know what her response is, Steve? <laughs> Actually not. It's a lottery. It doesn't really mean anything. That's what she says. Yeah. So my kid, who has been looking forward, wanting to, to do this for a very long time, and is not, you know, um, you know, we could say, yeah, she's privileged in some ways, but she's also neurodivergent. She's not fully privileged, right? She's had a lot of barriers in her life. And what she, about her friend? Did her friend get in? Her or? friend, you know, her friend is going to a private school now because she got a scholarship. Her family's not rich either, and but, she got but a scholarship. At, at 182, she knew she wasn't. She was get in. never. So she pursued yeah. other things. They, you know, and all of us had sort of because it was a lottery. We didn't put all our eggs in the basket. We were looking at other options. Mm -hmm. But in her friend is now going to a private school, so she's going to be gone from the public system. This is a very talented, very smart girl. So. The whole point here, I think, that we're trying to do is reconcile equity and merit. And I think there's a way to do it, but the lottery is not the way. Hold off on that for a second. What do you infer from Tasha's example there that tells a, a bigger story in your view? Well, I think a couple of things, Steve. Uh, the one thing I just wanted to mention, something that the chair mentioned, there actually has not been meaningful consultation on the lottery system. I think that's very, very important to note. As a matter of fact, the previous board in September put forward a motion asking to say, hey, wait a minute, let's pause this, let's have some meaningful consultation on lottery, and let's get more data before we move forward with this. And unfortunately, that didn't happen. Um, what I could say, Steve, is this, is that these schools, and I said I've worked in three of them, they're huge success stories. These are jewels in the crown of the TDSB, and they're going to be destroyed. These are hubs of excellence. Students with passion, interest, aptitude gather in these places. So simply checking off a box, now it's all you have to do. It doesn't show any interest, it doesn't show any passion, it doesn't show any ability at all. And what we're gonna have in the academic program, Steve, is a mismatch. We're gonna have students without the ability in these very rigorous academic programs, some of them with international standards, and they're not gonna be able to do it. So just to say we're gonna put a student in there and they're gonna flourish, I think that's really wishful thinking and it's not being honest with the people of Toronto and the people of Toronto really deserve better than that. Madam Chair, lots to respond to there, so fire away. So, I mean, with all due respect, I actually fundamentally disagree with the assumptions that are being made. I actually think it's a dangerous assumption to make that students, just because they haven't presented a portfolio or haven't written an entrance exam, that they aren't capable or that they might not have the passion to make it in these programs. I think it's important that trustees continue to monitor how this is working. I do believe that, and it was something that we embedded in the decision that we made. I was part of that board that made this decision. But I think we have to really check our assumptions that we make when we're talking about kids. But what about the specific example here of somebody who said, yeah, I got into the school, but it really doesn't I don't feel great about it because it doesn't reflect any achievement on my part other than I won the lottery. But your daughter is, and I would say to you, your daughter has a wonderful opportunity before her. She's going to a great school that actually traditionally hasn't had for many years, they haven't supposedly been having these kind of exams or portfolios to get in. Rosedale School for the Arts has been doing it a little bit differently than some of the other schools and they've had great results. And so I think this is an opportunity for her. And I actually push back a little bit about kids being just exceptional who come out of these art schools. I have to think that we have wonderful kids who get rich opportunities at their local high schools as well, and they produce lots of terrific people. Margaret Atwood came out of Leaside High School. We have examples of people becoming artists in all different ways, shapes, and forms, and I see that when I go into schools, but I also think She's got a great opportunity. She got in. And that's historically, not, not all kids have gotten in. That's just the reality. But that's We've not always the point. had kids. That's not the point. The point is that if you're going to create a school like Rosedale, for example, and Rosedale, too, has not had a pure merit system in the sense that, yes, you didn't have to do an audition, but you did have to demonstrate interest in a tangible way. You didn't have to just check a box and say, I want to go. Because as we know, some kids did check that box and they basically were not interested. They just wanted it for other reasons. So my daughter, what you're, te what you're telegraphing to kids is that effort 
doesn't matter. What you should be doing in the TDSB is giving kids the tools to be able to compete with kids like my daughter or her friend or anyone else who has worked on this and has a passion. Because it's false to say you're going to simply throw a child in in grade nine and say, now sink or swim. You have to equip them at the elementary and middle school levels. And that's what the TDSB should have done. Not a lottery at the end of the road, but at the start to give kids who don't have the opportunities in the schools you're talking about more resources and more support so they can compete in a fair playing field when they get to grade nine. Fair point? It is a fair point. It's a challenge we do have that's before us. I will say we are investing in more arts programming for kids at a younger age. We're investing in STEM at a younger age. We think all of those things are important. Part of it is to potentially equip them for high school in a specialty program in these, these centralized student programs, but also so that whatever school they are going to, we want them to have that rich educational experience, whether it's in STEM, whether it's in arts, whether it's in music. Those those are, that's part of what we think is really important in creating critical thinkers who are go on, going to go on to do great things with their life. And that is, our, that is the promise of public education. So that is a focus, um, but I would just say that I also don't think we have to have fully formed kids who know everything and know their, their, the extent of that passion and have developed that by grade nine. And I think it's important that when we get these kids in these programs, we all know that the teachers are the ones that really then take on that task mm -hmm. of making sure they are doing differentiated education and getting all kids up to speed and bringing them up. And we do believe our staff, if we invest in them and provide them with that, um, that learning and that uh, professional development, can do that with these kids. Richard, I want to circle back with you, mm -hmm. though, to the remarks I made in the introduction, which, which focused on not having just merit and not having just equity, but how do we achieve both? Right. They're both important values. Can you have both? Absolutely. Steve, the lottery system's actually an attack on merit. And I think it's really unfortunate that we're seeing this in public education today. You know, there's many people who've come to Canada, many newcomers who've come and they've told their children, if you study hard, if you work hard, opportunities and doors will open for you. I've heard from parents and I've heard from students. Some of the brightest students in the Toronto District School Board have been shut out of these programs. So how do we get both? How do we get merit and equity There's together? lots of ways we could do that. Steve, I know, for example, if we look at um, New York City, you know what they do? And Tasha was talking about this a little bit. What they do is they help students prepare for portfolios, for example, in grade seven, mm -hmm. so they can actually go and demonstrate an interest. You know, Steve, we have amazing teachers in these programs. And we we have to um, you know, really, really listen to them. I spoke to a teacher this morning and they said, you know, Richard, we have actually have not had any meaningful consultation about this process. And I would encourage, again, we need more consultation. No, no, I, I get the point on data. consultation, but I, I also, I, I wanna see the roadmap going forward. Where, where, what do you have to do in order to ensure that it's not only merit and not only equity, but you can marry the two of them? Well, I think there's a couple of ideas. First of all, there's a direct relationship between the number of students who are applying to the programs from these racialized groups to the student number of students getting in. So what we have to do is work on the application process. We need at a very young age, so all learners see themselves as scientists, doctors, astronauts, whatever the case is, so they want to apply for the programs. That's one, that's really important. Also, Steve, the lottery has to go. I think it's really, really clear. I've looked at you know, places, again, in the United States, et cetera, et cetera, and even they do this in, in other jurisdictions. We need some sort of a merit-based system. And again, there's not, nothing to say, and I know the, the board is identified, and we have to do more to get these underrepresented students into these programs. And I'm gonna throw a suggestion right here on the table, Steve. Mm -hmm. So we've talked about 20%, we're saving right now 20% of the seats for these learners. And what I would suggest is, let's continue saving 20% of these seats for the learners, but what we're gonna do, we're gonna do it on a merit-based system. So everyone will have to at least demonstrate an interest Everyone will have to demonstrate their passion. They want to go into these programs. All right, let me ask the chair. Are you open to revisiting the lottery? So I think at this point, it's premature to be considering and deciding what's going to happen because this is the first year, starting this coming year, 
that we will actually have kids who've come in through this new system where we aren't having portfolios or aren't having test exams. So you might, everybody at, you know, to the left of me seems to think that this will be a colossal failure. We don't actually have the data to show that at this point. Well, you probably so won't for five years then, we right? Won't, we, wait we won't for a little bit of time, right. but trustees have asked for reports back on all of this. Mm -hmm. What we do know is we have been slowly doing some of this work quietly in many of our schools, and the results have been really good with kids. So we feel actually, I feel a sense of promise, like I am excited to see the results. I'm excited to see how kids are doing. Um, so I don't, at this point, feel we are in need of reopening our process. And what would have to happen for you to consider reopening? Well, I think, first of all, what we are seeing is that there is a desire for more programs. We have more kids applying to these programs. I get it, but so when for the me data as comes trustee, in, as the data comes in, what do you need to see for you to say, hmm, the lottery is not working as well as I'd hoped? Well, I think we will look at it to make sure to see that kids are succeeding. What is it we need to do to ensure kids are succeeding if they aren't? If they aren't, mm -hmm. because we don't actually know that they won't. And I think we have to really think carefully about how we're talking about these things. These are kids too, right? What is success? And how, you know, how are we thinking about our kids who come in in grade nine and making sure that they are having the support and getting the support they need? Because whenever you get a grade nine class, there are kids who are at different levels. They've come from different schools. They've had different experiences. So making sure that our teachers are looking at that and making sure they're getting kids all up to speed and making sure they're, they're progressing. And I do believe that our staff can do that. But we also are looking at expanding our programs because we know there is such a desire. I mean, that's what the application process when we have removed these barriers has shown us that well, we have lots of kids from all over who do want to get involved. Minister of Education may still be in the green room. You can ask him on the way out. <laughs> uh, that's our time, everybody. I want to thank you all for coming in and having such a strong but civilized discussion here. Rachel Chernus lynn TDSB Chair, Richard Bilkso, former school principal, Tasha Kiridan. Everybody knows Tasha. <laughs> Thanks very much, everybody. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.